Hi, everyone. We're going to get started. Some may be joining us after traffic, if that's OK. All right, so thank you for coming. Welcome to Wilton Library. I'm Caroline Mandler, the executive director. We're so excited to um, co-host this event, kind of kicking off Mental Health Action Month with Wilton Youth Council. Um, and I will ask us, especially tonight, to turn off our phones for this event. <laughs> um, and we have, um, that Jen may talk about, a bunch of initiatives and programs throughout the month, which there's more information back there. But thank you for coming. I will turn it over to Jen Kepner from Wilton Youth Council. Thank you, Caroline. And thank you, I wanna thank all of our co-sponsors, Thrive with a Guide, Middlebrook PTA, Wilton High School PTSA, Wilton SEPTA, and Wild Bloom. And thank you all for coming tonight. I know there's lots of places you could be, and um, we're so happy you're here for this important conversation. Claudia Erickson is the co-founder of the Global Day of Unplugging. With a bachelor's degree in social work and a master's in public health, Claudia has over 20 years experience working in maternal child health for businesses such as San Diego State University, Scripps Children Ho Children's Hospital, the San Diego Police Foundation, and the San Diego chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Her work experience spans various public health issues from STD prevention, immunization education, breastfeeding, cyber safety, and literacy. And I was lucky enough to have lunch with Claudia today, and what impressed me most was her willingness to learn from anyone. Whether she's at a party and she wants to ask her friend's kids what they think about technology, or she has a friend with a, a child who's struggling, and she wants to invite him over to see what he thinks about gaming, I feel like the world is your classroom, and we are so lucky to be here to learn from you tonight. So um, before I turn it over to her, this is just a reminder that this is information only, and it's not meant to be medical advice or advice from a therapist. But I'm turning it over to Claudia. Thank you so much for that introduction. Do I need to be close to this? Probably. OK, I figured that out. So I appreciate that. I do feel like the world is, a, you know, my classroom. <laughs> I love to learn from everybody here, from kids. I think our kids are very important to learn from. Make sure you read what they had to say in the back, but we'll talk about that at the end a little bit. Um, you might be wondering why there's a thing for pinecone brownies, and I'm not obsessed with Christmas or late getting this updated, but this is just an example of how the algorithm knows me better than probably anybody else. Because this showed up on Instagram for um, gluten-free brownies with almond slivers, chocolate covered, and in the shape of pine cones. Like all those things I love, and it showed me, here's a recipe, which they were delicious, by the way, but not as easy as it looked like it was. <laughs> any rate, I, I feel like it's a challenge, and we need to try and work harder to get to know the people in our lives as well as that algorithm knows us. So. Why are we not clicking? We're not going. Wait a minute. It was on pause. So this is just a quick little video. Um, I don't know if you've seen this, it came out only a couple weeks ago, but it gets a little bit of information about kind of the mental health issue and then we'll go Something into Something has issues. gone wrong for America's children. At rates we've never seen before, they're anxious, they're lonely, they're depressed. What happened here, as you might suspect, a big part of the story is online. And as you might not suspect, the other big part of the story is parents. A lot of the turbulence in modern day America boils down to two basic facts. Number one, the internet is awesome. Number two, the internet is awful. Now, really, America should be better equipped to deal with this paradox. After all, we're a country that specializes in things that start out promising, but inevitably go off the rails. Cheeseburgers, big trucks, Kanye. Uh. And well, where the internet is concerned, you know how this story goes. Most of us are glued to our devices most of the time. And this 
is a decidedly mixed bag. Half of the time were productive, in touch with friends, or at least entertained, and the other half were just kind of scrolling and not feeling great about it. But here's where things get complicated. If finding a healthy balance between when to be online and when to be unplugged is a struggle for adults, it's something closer to a full-blown mental health crisis for adolescents. Now, it's worth noting that the problem here isn't really the internet per se. Millennials, the first generation that came of age with widespread internet access, didn't really see much in the way of corresponding mental health problems. And in hindsight, it's easy to see why. You were a lot less likely to spend hours at a time texting back when writing the letter S required pressing seven four times. Also, it was harder to spend your whole life online when you could get knocked off any time your mom picked up the phone. You'll never understand this, Gen Z, but it was the closest thing millennials had to Vietnam. But over the last decade or so, things changed. A lot. In 2011, only 23% of American teens had a smartphone. Only five years later, 79% of them did. In 2015, about one out of every four teenagers said that they were online almost constantly. By 2022, it was nearly half. And as the social psychologist Jonathan Haidt describes in his book, The Anxious Generation, the results of all that screen time are not great. Haidt notes that beginning in the early 2010s, we started to see dramatic reductions in the mental well-being of young people. Rates of major depression for teenagers went up by around 150%. Anxiety amongst the young shot through the roof. There was an enormous spike in suicide rates among young adolescents. And there was a massive drop-off in the number of teenagers who said that they were satisfied with themselves. And Haidt's research found a consistent pattern. All around the world, rapid changes in the unwellness of young people tended to correspond with rapid changes in technology. Which technologies? It wasn't just smartphones and high-speed internet access, though that helped. The biggest changes came with the introduction of phones with front-facing cameras that facilitated more selfies and videos, and the growth of interactive social media features such as likes, shares, retweets, comments. The result? A world in which kids at the most impressionable ages constantly feel pressure to cultivate an image for their peers and get judged for it in real time. And a world in which kids can constantly compare themselves to people who seem happier, prettier, or more popular than them. Now, chances are, you're not entirely surprised by this. Many of us have had the sensation of realizing that we're spending too much time on social media and feeling less happy as a result. Imagine how much worse that is for young people whose brains are still years away from fully developing the capacity for self-control or delayed gratification. But here's the part you may not have seen coming. While Jonathan Haidt argues that part of the reason kids' well-being is suffering is because they're drowning in the worst aspects of online life, he argues that the other part is that we've removed too many opportunities for kids to develop in the real world. In the last few decades, the rise of overprotective parenting has dramatically reduced kids' opportunities to do things on their own. Playing with other kids unsupervised, on the decline. Trick-or-treating without a chaperone, forget about it. Going into a different aisle of the grocery store than your parents, you'll need a police escort. And what do you get when kids aren't allowed to do anything in the real world but have endless access to the virtual one? Well you get lines like this. The amount of time kids spend just hanging out with each other is plummeting. And that has a couple of worrying implications. First, it means that these days, E.T. would be shit out of luck. But second, it means that kids are losing one of the most important tools for becoming functional adults, real world interactions. In the same way that kids need to be exposed to things like dirt and bacteria in order to build up a functioning immune system, they also need to be exposed to all the difficulties that come with navigating the outside world and other kids in order to transform into confident, capable adults. 
Talking with friends in person rather than via text means learning how to read body language and communicate by methods other than emojis. Getting cuts and bruises from skateboarding or climbing a tree teaches them how to judge risk and bounce back from setbacks. Letting kids freely play with each other without adult supervision teaches them teamwork, how to manage disagreements, and how to solve problems on their own. But as a recent study in the Journal of Pediatrics showed, today, American kids have fewer and fewer of those opportunities, and likely as a result, feel like they have less ability to handle their own problems. So yes, helping our kids does mean letting them spend less time in the online abyss, but it'll also mean giving them more freedom. Freedom to fail, freedom to succeed, freedom to get their feelings hurt, freedom to gain confidence they never knew they could have. That'll always be scary for parents. But let's face it, so are most things that are necessary to help children transform into adults. It may be tough, but it's the right thing to do for our children. And also probably the right thing to do for E.T. All right. So I thought that was just a nice little synopsis of a whole lot of things that we've kind of heard about, but it puts it all together. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story now as to why I came to do this. And part of it's my own, you know, being tangled with tech. I have my own challenges as well. Um, but it started with my son. So this is our firstborn. He's just two here. And we went to a party, and there was a girl that was slightly older than him that was doing computer games, and he took to it immediately, and we were all impressed, like, oh my gosh, he's gonna be the next Bill Gates. Yeah, you know, of course, let's get him every educational CD there is. So we had a stack of them. This was before online games. Didn't think anything about worrying about addiction or dependency or any of that. But needless to say, that was what would, you know, kind of comprise our relationship for many years. So anybody else relate to trying to get their kids off technology? And yeah, so it's familiar. Um, and what I would come to find is that I'm battling thousands of engineers whose job it is is to make that game so engaging that it keeps them doing it all the time. And it's not a fair fight. So it was tough. I didn't see it coming, but it happened. Um, we started out with really good intentions. We did have our fun little outdoor trips and things, but nothing was quite as good as you know, the games. Um, I remember this picture thinking, if I could just protect these kids and hold them tight, everything's going to be great. I didn't want them to go through the tough times that I had growing up. Um, and if I look back at that, this is where I may have started out a little helicopter parenting as I was, you know, in my reflection mode. Um, I grew up in Houston, Texas, had an unconventional family with a German dad who had a temper and was an alcoholic, and a mom who was sometimes depressed trying to deal with all of that. Um, and I became a very anxious, fearful, shy kid. Here I am slinking down, trying to hide with my eyes closed, hoping everybody will leave me alone <laughs> and not be there. I got many a report card coming home saying, Claudia was a lovely girl, but we never heard from her once the entire semester. I was just afraid of everything. So it would take a while for me to find my voice, but Parents did divorce, moved to the Midwest. I had a typical latchkey childhood, if any of you know what that is, where, yeah, free range, pretty much. So I watched way too much TV. I could probably beat any of you at TV trivia for the 70s and 80s, I'm embarrassed to say. But TV went to sleep, you know, and it wasn't as engaging. It was Gilligan's Island, right? It wasn't on all the time. I still had plenty of time to go out and run around with my friends, socialize. Um, we talked on the phone all the time, but that phone was connected to the wall. So you couldn't do quite as much damage as you can today. I was super eager to go out and become independent and make money. I was babysitting at 11, detasseled corn, cleaned houses, 12, 13, I had a paper out, and I got a waitressing job the minute I turned 14. I wanted to be independent, so did my friends. I wanted to get a moped, which I did. I wanted a car the minute I turned 16. This lovely gremlin, it looks like this. I think every kid should have a, you know, a POS car as their first car. So I had little rules and many adventures, and some of that's great, and I know that a lot of people hearken back to those times going, our kids could, should have all 
of those lovely experiences and the freedoms that we had, but it wasn't all great. I mean, I certainly read too many inappropriate books, saw inappropriate movies, and had inappropriate men do things that was damaging for me. So I felt like, not my kids, right? I also did things like this. I painted disco boogie fever all over our basement with tin foil when my mom came home from work without permission, because we were having a disco party. I got into a lot of stuff. She was working three jobs and she could just barely keep up with us. So I thought, that's not happening with my family, even though I have great pictures now to show. <laughs> but started out strong. We moved into this lovely neighborhood that didn't have sidewalks and there were no kids playing around. Um, it was two years before we would meet anybody with kids in the neighborhood. And I was like, what's going on? So I made up a flyer with this picture and it went around asking people, hey, do you want to be my friend? Do you want to start a play group? My husband said, you're going to make them all think you're nuts. Uh, but he was wrong, because we had 10 families that created a play group with us that we're still friends with most of those people to this day. So we created a support system. I still think this is a good way to go today. Go in person, talk to people, and meet them. Um, but it was interesting for me now to reflect back and go, even then, before social media, before all the online stuff, we were scared to let our kids run around outside. I was already thinking, they're going to be nabbed. Something inappropriate is going to happen. I didn't want any of that. So it was already there. Now, this is my son with the crazy idea I had for, hey, if he's going to do technology, let's do something he can use for a career. So we created a botball team that I was coach of, and I know nothing about technology <laughs> for robotics. But um, I was like, we'll do anything, because I want to engage with him and get him involved in things. So we did win an award because I'm type A and so is my son, the rookie award, and I got a coach to do it. But um, we had my niece who came to live with us when she was just 11, and she was very vibrant and energetic and happy-go-lucky kid, um, but also she came with a MySpace account and very young with a MySpace account, and that's how old she is. She's 28 now, but that was the thing then. Um, and was doing the sexy selfies, and we were very worried about it. And so we said, if you live with us, you can't have the technology. We need to wait on all that. She outsmarted us pretty much every turn. There were not parental controls then. You had some spyware, like phone share. So we used that, and it didn't work very well. <laughs> so that was a challenge. Um, and then my daughter, who's the youngest, um, she was not as interested in technology early on. She loved nature, and I really encouraged that. And she had her own business, which I encouraged to the point of her dying to quit for two years when she was 13, 14. But I, I kept her going because I was afraid she was going to get sucked into the same little rabbit hole that my other two were on, which pretty much is what happened when she got a phone. Like everybody, face, they're gone for a while. So that was kind of sad. I tried very hard to juggle all the balls and keep things going and get you know make very exciting, interesting things for them to do. Um, to keep them so that it's not all about technology. That's part of my why. We'll come back to how they're doing all better now. But this is Hayden Hunstable. Um, this was his 12th Fortnite birthday party. He loved gaming. Happy-go-lucky kid. Um, during the pandemic, he had more time online like all kids, and that's where his friends were hanging out. He was gaming one night. He took his keyboard when he lost, and he smashed the monitor and cracked it. His parents took away his privileges. Um, and made him wait a while, and then he earned the right back to do it again, to try, and it happened again. He lost, the kids were piling on him, and instead of telling anybody, he went in the closet and hung himself. Every time I say that, I start getting choked up. So, he was not 13, and there's a movie they made about him called Almost 13. This is his dad, and he wants you to have conversations with your kids. I will get through this. <laughs> so that's his thing. Conversations matter. Because if you don't know, I did not myself, the second leading cause of death for 10 to 14-year-olds is suicide. And it's usually an impulsive action. So if he'd thought about it even a little bit or talked to somebody, probably would never have done it, right? It's not like somebody who plans and everything. So Brad Hunstable is always telling you, have conversations. If it's embarrassing or it's sad or it makes you angry, it doesn't matter. Come talk to me or talk to a trusted adult um, because you may be able to work through this. So 
So playtime used to look like this, you know, kids working out the rules and, and just free play, and now it looks more like this. It's kind of solitary, even if they're in the same room. These could be girls on their phone in a room. It's the same thing, right? It, it tends to be that way with gaming. You want to have your chair, you want to have your headset, you want to have your stuff, your account. So it's meant to kind of, you know, it's supposed to be fun and social, and it is, but also it is sort of more isolating, you know. So kids still want adventures and challenges. And this young man on the left uh, is a little daredevil. And uh, you can't maybe tell, but he has a huge grin on his face, even though he's duct taped to a tree. And that's because older boys were doing this. They liked him. They let him play with him because he would do whatever challenges came up. And he became that guy. He was prided himself on being the one that'll do whatever TikTok challenge comes up or YouTube challenge, right? So uh, that did not go so well for him. So the point of the counting all these bands, he had to tell me what that means. Um, that's the money you're going to get if enough people like this and see this. So he was chasing that dream. But he got a lot of scrapes and bruises and concussions, and his fingers are all jacked up from playing games. He's the one that comes to visit me and tells me all about the um, teen hacking tips. Um, he still feels the pressure now to what are you going to do next? What's the next challenge going to be? And he's like, I've done so many. And it's starting, he's starting to see it's not, it's not working so great for him. He's homeschooled because he did too many challenges at the school that they've asked him not to return for a little while. So he really wants to go back. And it's almost like talking to a 40-year-old when I talk to him. He's 16. He's an awesome kid. But he wants the challenge. And a lot of boys are missing that. That's been gone for a while. So um, TikTok is more than happy to fill that void, and games do too. So this is, this is literally the only graph. I pulled all my other graphs out. We're not doing a lot of graphs. But this one, semi-adult activities. Kids are not interested in doing this stuff as much anymore. Trying alcohol, getting a driver's license, having sex, and working. Now you may go, a couple of those I'm not having a problem with <laughs> that they're waiting on. But you would probably like them to get their driver's license if possible. Um, I think it's important because you don't want kids to wait and wait and wait and then all the things they've got to learn when they've left your home. They're overwhelmed with what they are expected to do when they leave. So if you can have them take care of some of these things earlier, it's great. Um, and working provides so many experiences, I can't even tell you. Our kids were okay in sports, but they weren't going to be Olympic athletes or anything like that. So we're like, get a job. A job will be a great thing for you. You can learn to take orders from someone other than us. And then, by the way, they come home and they're grateful and they tell you about it. You're like, oh, you poor thing. But it's really wonderful for them to learn to take a job that's not fancy or high end or anything and do grunt work and grow from that. So. So screen time stats, I think the video already talked about it, but it's an awful lot. Pretty much everybody has a smartphone now, right? And TV watching is a screen. And I add this because invariably I have run into so many older people um, over the years, and they will go, oh, I'm so glad you're doing this. This is just all those kids, and they just need to learn better. And they're so disrespectful and ignoring us, and their phones you know, take over their lives. And they'll go home and they'll sit on the couch and watch TV for six hours. So they're the group that are watching the most TV. We're all having our attention grabbed in one way or another, and it's really easy to sit here and judge one group versus another. But how much connecting are we doing? So my thing may be that I get sucked into Pinterest. Yours may be gaming. Yours may be YouTube. But it's so fun to listen to people judge the boys judging the girls why are they on social media all the time and the girls are like why are they gaming all the time so we're all having our attention grabbed and it comes up to a add up to a lot of time it's pretty much half our days and half our lives that are spent between work and and fun time on screens and the impact they went into some of the impact already in the video so i'm just hitting on a couple they did not and one of them is um, eye problems, and the kids mentioned that, by the way, in that survey. Um, so nearsightedness has doubled in the last 50 years. This is part of why China has really come down hard on restrictions for kids, because they're worried about it. And of course, weight gain. 
we're moving a whole lot less than we used to. It makes a lot of sense that this would be a problem, but 43% more likely to be obese. You're gonna sit there and snack on all of the good stuff that you probably shouldn't be when you're gaming too. And a lot of people are saying, well, my kids will figure it out and they'll learn how to like eat better and be more active when they are grown. Let them have fun now. Plus they're being entertained. But we're already seeing problems. Just over one in three young adults are too heavy to serve in our military already, 17 to 24. And of those already serving, 70% are obese or overweight. <laughs> so this is a big issue for military readiness and they need people to be fit. I don't have it here, but I know there's also been new data about how kids are coming thinking this will be like gaming and I've been practicing and so I'm good. And those kids are addicted to the gaming, so when they have free time, that's what they're doing and they're staying up too late and they're tired and they're falling asleep on the job and it's problematic, so. This is another one that certainly affects me and probably a lot of people is this neck thing. Chiropractors are never gonna be out of business. Like, they have so much work and they're seeing young kids coming in with problems they used to only see in older people. Um, and the biggie is this, that it's a normal texting tilt that you have looking down at your phone is pretty much like the force of 50 to 60 pounds pulling on your spine and your ligaments and tendons. So, you know, how did we get here? We're living in an attention-based economy. Everybody's trying to get our attention, all the companies. And another thing is that we have a multitude of ways to communicate. And while some of that is great, I don't know about you, but I'm so exhausted when I have to try and remember, where was that woman that I spoke to two weeks ago? Was it on WhatsApp or was it a text or was it an Instagram message or wait a minute, was it email and which one, the three emails? Like, I don't know how much time is wasted trying to figure out where somebody, you know, communicated with me. So that's challenging. So who vies for our attention? Literally everybody. <laughs> Advertisers, the news, tech and social media companies are fantastic at this. But really now, it's anybody and little grandma down the road who would have nothing to do with Instagram before the pandemic figured it out and now she's selling her cookies to you. And I'm like, yay grandma, you figured it out. But now we have more people than ever advertising to us um, and trying to get our attention. So we're all kind of part of the problem if we do that. So the big thing is that the competition. We all hear about streaming wars, right? So Netflix doesn't want you to go to Amazon and Hulu doesn't want you to do Prime. Um, all of the gaming companies compete with each other. Who's got the coolest game right now and who's gonna learn from the last one and make it even better? Social media companies, obviously. And the big thing is that they have models based on growth. So their staff are incentivized to increase engagement. So think about that if every year, <laughs> let's get more time out of everybody. We're hitting a point where this is, we're starting to really feel it, you know? So there's more to wade through, but there's one thing we've never been able to change, no matter what. We get 24 hours out of the day. That's it, we cannot milk one more minute. I would like to. If somebody figures out how, please tell me. But we can't, and we are really having a hard time dealing with all the attention, I think. So just a little bit about how some of these apps and things get our, you know, get our attention. What creates dependency? Some apps are really great. Jeep, what? It's sticking. I don't know what happened there. Wow. Sorry. So some apps are great. Just ignore that while I talk. And they, um, shoot. Hope you don't read backward. <laughs> okay. So like Maps, Google Maps is great because I punch in exactly what I want. I can't believe it went this far this fast. Wow. There's technology. Um, you, you punch in exactly what you want and all I get is an address and that's it. I don't get anything else, it doesn't call out to me. I love GPS, thank you, it's good. But a lot of it is designed to be addicting. Um, it's completely meant that way, we all know likes, you know, that gives you that great feeling, you get the dopamine hit and conversely, if you aren't able to, you get the cortisol and it makes you wanna check more but uh, they use a variable reward system 
which means you don't know when it's going to come. You're going to check, am I going to get the like this time or the third time or the tenth time? You don't know when it's coming. That's what makes you go back the most often. Can't, can't do it, you're going to get anxious. Um, they use gimmicks to tempt us to come back often. You know, LinkedIn always is calling you back. You haven't been here a while. Or Facebook, same thing. Uh, they have features making it very hard to leave, easy to stay. They use AI to show you a tailored feed. And for those people that are thinking, you know, I don't like anything, I go on and look at stuff, but I'm not going to like it. So then the algorithm is not learning. If you're hovering, it knows. So it knows you hovered over that ad for five seconds, so it may then show you more tennis shoes. Um, and the other thing is we get invested in these apps. So this is where our friends are, and this is where our pictures are, and sometimes it's kind of like your, your memory book, right? So social media engagement, Instagram has that never-ending scroll feature. You don't know when you're done, so you're going to keep looking. They took it away for a while, and then they brought it back. I don't know why. Surprising. <laughs> they do likes and intermittent bursts, and this is a thing you can do at home with your kids or whoever. If you have someone that has two Instagram accounts, post something on there, and you maybe wait 15, 20 minutes, and you look and you go, I only got one like. Oh, that's kind of pathetic. What's going on? If you immediately click to the other account and then go straight back, you may suddenly see five more likes came. And you're like, did five people like me in that second? They did not. They hold it back and they give you bursts because they know that that is more rewarding for you. So that's always kids are like, really? I had never noticed that before. And then you try it and sure enough, it does it. Facebook has some activities that get more engagement than others. Videos and reels are going to be shown more because instead of a picture that takes one second to look at, a video is going to take some time. They show you those most relevant comments. If you've posted something and you see there are 75 comments, but they only show most relevant, it's going to be something that either makes you really happy or makes you um, crazy angry. Because again, that's what will keep your eyeballs looking longer. Snapchat uses these things called snap streaks. And they may not be quite as popular as they used to be, but I understand kids are still using them. And they're essentially a number of days that two people have exchanged pictures, which are what snaps are. Um, back and forth. So I may take a picture of that, the head over there, and send it to you, and then you send a picture back to me of a tree. If we do that two days in a row, we've had a two-day streak. So if you drop the streak, one person doesn't do it, you lose it and you have to start all over again. So there are kids that have been doing this for years, every day. And it's like a measure of a friendship that we're keeping this up. They're sending pictures of the floor or the ceiling just to keep it going. It's just sort of silly. The crazy thing is that now, recently, they've come out with Snap Restore. For 50 cents, you can restore the whole thing. I can't imagine how angry I'd be if I was the girl that I know that had one of these for two and a half years going. 50 cents, you can get it all back. They've, they give away their password to their friends to keep it going if they've gotten grounded. They want to not lose the streak so bad. The new thing is the Snap Solar System. I don't know if anybody's seen this. Um, it's basically a way to kind of show where you are in your friend circle of value. So the one closest to you is your best friend, and the one farthest away is not such a good friend anymore. Can't imagine how that could go bad in a middle school. What a horrible idea. Um, and it is now inactive by default because so many people complain, but it's still there so your kid can just turn it on. This is causing a lot of problems, especially in girl world. All of these things make money for the apps and the advertisers. And there'll be another thing. This will be old. There'll be other things come out. So. so my tailored feed, as someone who's been on Facebook since 2009, Instagram 2018, it knows me so well that I'd love to do this girls' night craft. It knows that I love Labradoodles, because I have two of them, that I'm interested in organizations that are not using social media to promote their thing anymore. It, thought that I'd be interested in this what's the right age to get an AI girlfriend podcast <laughs> and it's really fascinating by the way totally recommend it and they're right it was it also shows me other groups doing digital wellness things advocacy groups so that I can see what they're doing which is great but I also get FOMO I'm like dang it I should be doing more like <laughs> I should be doing all those things so 
It gets better and better. It's never going to forget. It's only going to always remember everything, unlike the rest of us, right, as we get older. So let's just say you don't have enough likes and followers and you want more of that. There are these things called click farms. This is one of the things that teens absolutely are fascinated by. These are two different click farms. These are found in Bangladesh, China, the Philippines, Thailand. And essentially, they're, um, they're hooked up to these different either phones or computers, and they go around and go like, 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 like on everything. Politicians and influencers use them. And they're making fake accounts and then liking everything. And it gives you, you know, a big following really quick and the impression that you're popular. And you might think, now, why would a politician stoop to this and be doing this? But if you think about it, they have to get all of their stuff out to you, and they have to get it picked up, so they have to play along with the algorithm rules. And the algorithm rules are, we're going to show people stuff that is sensational and very engaging and with lots of followers. Otherwise, you don't get out there. So that's why they get them. Um, the cost of buying likes, 10000 for 50 bucks. used to only be 1000 for 50 bucks. so likes not what it used to be worth anymore. A lot more for a follower, but again, they're not real followers, but then they'll actually stay on there and, and like continually. And almost half Instagram influencers use these in 2021. So all those big accounts with the huge number of followers, and their kids doing it too, by the way, it's not that expensive. Um, it's not real. The reality is very sad. This is a low paying job like a sweatshop. Very hot in there, few windows. They make miserable pay, $120 a year for Bangladesh workers. It's more for the owners who can make like a grand or 2000 per month. So who says farming doesn't pay? It's my husband's from farming community. He likes that joke. <laughs> it does for somebody. Um, so now we're going to talk just a little bit about TikTok. So I don't know if you know this, but China has, they're the ones that created TikTok, but they have a very different version there than what we see here. Theirs is sanitized. And they have strict rules. Video games in China, kids can play one hour, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights. That's it. <laughs> For Du Yin, they can have 40 minutes a day. And they are showing things under um, what they call youth mode. So they're showing really wholesome content, how to be nice to your teachers, Science experiment, um, it, museums, all of this stuff is controlled. They want, they're worried about their, you know, their kids, future workforce. With the survey, what do you want to be when you grow up? The number one answer for kids in China, an astronaut, which is great. TikTok in the US, and please, I know that TikTok, some people are TikTok fans, they love it, I get it. I know it has a lot of good stuff too, and I'm seeing the commercials trying to tell me how great it would be for everybody. But they also show a lot of sexual content. Challenges like the Benadryl and the Skull Breaker Challenge, that's what this is, where kids come out. Two kids come on both sides of a kid and kick out his feet from underneath him. And this is a mom said I could share this with you, where he had a concussion and all these bruises. Um, there's the blackout challenge where you would hold your breath until you pass out. 80 deaths from that that they know of. And you think, why would kids be doing this? This just seems so stupid. Why would they do this? But they're, they're seeing the world that reinforces this behavior and reinforces attention getting behavior. And some of them are fun. So you do the fun ones, maybe you'll do the one that's a little edgy. So the number one pick for kids about the survey in the US, what do you think? It's not an astronaut, I'll tell you that. You guys all knew, it's an influencer, that's right. So there's the reality, you need one million followers to be an influencer and your odds are less than 1%. But how many kids are chasing that dream? That's what I wanna be when I grow up. Hear it all the time. They're not making the money, but somebody is. So how do games capture our attention? Well, a lot of them are built as free and easy to play on the, on the handheld devices, which I know all the teachers hated when that happened. Um, I get it. They created new markets. Didn't used to be the females, but now the females are gaming too. They marketed heavily to that group. They got the young kids with the Minecraft and the Roblox, which is, you know, these sandbox games where they can get very creative and it's open-ended and explore a world, no end, 
Should be the red flag right there. There's no <laughs> end. Um, and it's just another like stepping stone to later games. They have all these challenges. They use celebrities. And players spend on an average $58 for this quote unquote free game, which Epic Games makes a lot of money off of. $32 billion in 2023. So let's do the math on this. This is another one that the kids really like, and I confirmed with my gamer friend that this is accurate. So according to a 2021 survey, your chances of becoming a professional gamer, eSports streamer kid are 0.1 to 0.3%. It's really low. And a poll of 2,000 players, only 51% made any kind of money. And of those, they made about $1,264 within 12 months. Now, if you're a 10-year-old boy, what you're seeing from that is, I could make over $1,000. <laughs> but if you know, these guys are practicing eight hours a day, at least. And if we can do the math, 63 cents an hour. It's, it's not great, but there are a lot of kids, again, chasing this dream as well. So I call it Fortnite follow-up, but it could be called anything. I don't mean to be bagging on Fortnite. They're just, you know, it was a fun name and works. Um, parents and schools, of course, complaining. We've got behavioral issues, all kinds of problems. Kids not showering, eating. They're losing sleep, in-person connections, exercise. And I, I will note that the sleep thing, if you're talking to your kid and they're a gamer, don't bill it to them like, you need to stop because you're losing sleep. They pride themselves on being able to pull all-nighters and I slept less than you. You know, I'm in two hours, I did one, I stayed up all night. So they're thinking you have to really get into their brains if you're gonna talk to them about this. People are entering treatment facilities for addiction. Kids are charging money on parents' accounts. I hear this complaint a lot. And we could do a whole talk on predators. Everybody's afraid of the predators outside. They're way more common online. And they're easy to blend in because you can't tell if they're male female, what age they are, any of that. Kids get really vested in the game. So they have their skins, which if you don't know, you get to have like a persona in the game. Um, they have their scores, their friends there. It's their life. It's almost their alter ego sometimes. And games are killing some relationships too. People filing for divorce because they prefer World of Warcraft to their wives. <laughs> So I'm always worried, what are we missing out on? All those hours spent trying to do all this, what are we not learning, you know? And so some people will say, well, oh, this is crazy, I'd never played those games, but don't take away my Wordle. <laughs> I love Wordle, my husband loves Wordle. And all the Erdle iterations that have come after it, including Strands, which just came out, which I did try, because I try to, you know, be aware. I did it for an hour, it was very frustrating. I could see where it's a good challenge. There's nothing wrong with the game. The point is I wasted an hour, and am I gonna do, lose an hour every single day on this new game? So for me, it's no. So we'll talk a little bit about tracking trust in AI. I know this is a biggie and that parents today are doing a lot of tracking, and that air tags are a great, easy, inexpensive solution. Throw it on the kid's backpack, give them a watch. They'll be great and I'll know where they are. I'm not a fan, you can do what you want, but I'm gonna just tell you that if you do do it, don't overuse it. And you have to think, if you put it on them when they're five, are you ever gonna stop tracking them until they're married? You're probably gonna keep doing it. So think about that and plan for an endpoint. Many a college kid has told me how irritated they are <laughs> that they're still being tracked by their parents now because they're just used to it. You can always turn it on if, if you want to have it, so you can know if they're taking a cross-country trip and they want you to be involved, that kind of thing. But conversations are really important, and it, particularly for this reason, with the peer dating relationships. I'm very concerned that kids are being, th it's normalized to track and be tracked. So they're doing it with their friends, they're doing it with their boyfriend and girlfriends, and it's very quick to get from tracking to stalking. Um, so you have a couple that have been together, they're 15, they love each other, are never going to break up, and they've got the whole Snapchat tracking thing going, and then one of them wants out, and all of a sudden it's a problem, and they're, they're tracking them and, and hounding them. So those are questions to have. 
So trust is at an all-time low. Does anybody fall for this ever again, biggest sales of the season? No, there will be another one next week. But we see it, and so we're just used to all these things. We don't trust the news media anymore. Um, we don't trust newspapers. The only thing worse is TV news. We trust it 11%. And this is really bad because we have a lot of important things going on right now, and we need people to be aware, but um, there's a reason for that. We also have to worry about being hacked all the time or fished. Luckily, this guy is not using spell check because he put her profile picture and somehow thought this would appeal to me. I don't know. But <laughs> $10 billion overall for online scams in 2023. This is an enormous jump, and a lot of that's due to AI, and it's only going to jump even more because it's just easier now. So you may go, well, I don't use social media. I don't know why any of this matters. Like, is this not, this doesn't apply to me, right? But I have to tell you, Facebook um, in and of itself is still kind of king, even if you don't use it. I have three billion monthly users, no one else can say that, and they drive the market. And people in other countries that don't even have other sources only have Facebook, so it's really making an impact in other places. But here, um, they kind of lead the way, and if you are a reporter, you need to get your story picked up. So similar to the politicians, you have got to play along with the algorithm if you want to get your story on the news. Because there's no more 5 o'clock, 10 o'clock news thing that you're getting ready for. It's 24-7. You have to get it picked up on Facebook X. Um, and so what's going to get picked up? Sensational stuff. There's a lot of fake news, misinformation, disinformation. If you ever saw this one, I was banned from TV for being too violent. Like and share if you grew up watching me on TV, have a gun and haven't shot or killed anyone. I don't know if anybody saw this, Yosemite Sam. A lot of people saw it. Um, and you might go, well, what side was that for? It was meant to kind of egg on a lot of people. It was from a Russian troll farm. So they're happily, countries are putting stuff out there to make us fight. They love that we're not getting along. They love the infighting. It works out great for them. Um, but the ultimate thing is that you have to realize we are not seeing the same information. We saw that with the vaccine debate that went sour so fast, uh, Black Lives Matter movement, um, Ukraine war, and now we're seeing it with the Palestine-Israel thing. And this was from Black Lives Matter. Um, my town had riots and it went um, very sour quickly. And this was all over social media. A rioter accidentally dropped this, oops, and it showed how to make incendiary devices to throw into buildings. And another one, get paid to be a professional anarchist. And it was like, somebody left this here. And there are people paying people to do this. Neither of these were accurate. But by the time we figured that out, that it was from another year and another place, it was too late. They, they went up, people came out, we had businesses burned to the ground, um, people were robbed, it was horrible. Um, and, you know, that happened other places as well. So try this, this is another thing you can do at home. Find somebody with a different viewpoint than you and Google a word that might, you know, result in a different thing. Like vaccines or Trump Biden or the current war situation. If you do it when there's a huge breaking news story, it may show the same thing for both sides, but a lot of times you will see very different information come across your phone versus theirs. This We did this with our teens and it was so helpful for them to see we're seeing totally different information. So AI deep fakes isn't this the sweetest photo? They look like a couple of like, really happy buddies, right? They're hanging out. It's, they look so happy. Or there was the Michael Scott um, spoof of Ron DeSantis, where he's in the woman's suit um, by accident. And of course, they were playing off of Ron DeSantis' political views about women and all of that. So those are funny, but there are going to be, and there already have been a lot of serious AI deep fakes, and it's very hard to tell what's real and what's not. So you're gonna have to be aware, especially as we're heading into between now and the end of the year. So AI is definitely being used for harassment. Taylor Swift had deep fake pornography. It looked, ex it looked like her, horrible. Um, 
You like to think she could do something about it because she's a powerful person. Maybe she can, but this is happening to just average everyday people and there's very little you can do. Law enforcement is completely overwhelmed, completely overwhelmed. Um, I've had three people reach out to me that had sextortion things happen to them and there's just not much help. So it's a growing problem and you have to know that it now only takes three seconds to clone your voice. So if you're picking up the phone when you don't recognize the number or who it's from and you go, hello, what do you want? That's it. Like, and then they can make a scam. They call it the grandparent scam where they'll do this with kids and then that kid's voice is used to call grandma, which they've figured it all out from you know, Facebook, who's, who's what kid and saying, I just had an accident, I need some money, I don't want my parents to get mad, you know, that kind of thing. So a lot of people are falling for this. Um, and a lot of teens think they're too smart for this, but we're seeing a lot of boys falling prey to this with um, rings that are starting in other countries, and they just send a picture of a sexy looking 14 year old girl who shows a picture of herself and then asks for one in return. And I don't know what it is about the boys, but they seem to be okay sending pictures of themselves. So, and then they're um, suddenly, you know, being extorted for money. So conversations matter is important on that one, right? Also this, so deep fakes. I don't know if you know this, but there are at least a dozen apps that can undress a woman um, and you can just have a picture and then it will show what she probably looks like naked. And now they're very inexpensive. I think there might even be a free one. Um, this was one of a Jenna Ortega at 16 that was circulating around. And there were ads for this on Facebook and Instagram, and they only got pulled when NBC did a story on them. So this is only gonna get easier to do, and you're gonna wanna talk to your kids to say, I want you to come to me, because this would certainly not be anybody's fault. And if you can't come to me, come to somebody. So conversations matter. Okay, this is the last AI thing, okay. <laughs> so this is another new thing. You don't need to go home and tell everybody about it, but you need to be aware because I'm hearing this is coming. So AI girlfriends. This was a woman who was an influencer and she had a, a big following, but she wanted more. So she made an open AI version of herself and she made $70,000 in a week. You could pay $1 a minute to be her boyfriend. So unfortunately, that was only, I don't know, not even a year ago that that happened. And now we have how to make your own custom AI girlfriend. And if you think that's just not, not a big thing that's happening, 75,000 views of the search to do that, and that was three months ago. So I'm hearing it's creeping up there, and. The big thing they want you to get from this is that imagine how tempting this will be for the boy who's home alone, gaming, shy, awkward. I wanna figure out how to talk to girls and they're already selling themselves like that. This is how you can learn how to, right? So, and she's always available and she's beautiful and she never disagrees with you. That's like all women, right? No, so it will be tempting. It will be very, t and they'll think, I'm just playing around, it's just funny, ha, ha, ha. But then they're engaging. They also are called AI models. So here's one, she looks pretty realistic, and she was created to be appealing to gamers with the purple hair. If you think that she's too edgy, they have a friend. She's shy and quiet and likes reading. They both have names that have AI in them. They were created by these people last month in Spain. They created Aitana and Maya, and they gave them personas, and they have a big following, and, they t and they're pretty much billing them like they're, they're gonna go down the path of the AI girlfriend thing. But they said they did it because they wanted to have models that weren't flaky and that would show up and look like they wanted for their designs. This is going to be hard to resist, and it's gonna be impossible to compete with for the poor girls out there. So when I see this picture, it used to make me feel like the old, the old guy that I was complaining about before, saying, it's just these kids today, you know, everybody's checked out. Um, but now I get what's going on. This is just all the apps reaching out to them with exactly the right message at exactly the right time. Maybe they've got a movie that 
they should watch. Maybe they've got some package that came in. Maybe um, there's a match on a dating app. It's time to play gaming you know, with me. LinkedIn, you've got emails. There are so many, I don't even have them all, but most people have many, many apps on their young people. So they're being reached out to all the time. And ultimately, there's just an awful lot happening in that device. So I say that because come to your kids and people with empathy. It's not that they're being rude or trying to be rude. They're being marketed to really intensely. And it only gets worse. So what can we do? That's the end of the bad stuff. <laughs> what can we do? So we can look at what the Silicon Valley families are doing because they know about the stuff, how engaging it is, because they create it. And they've been doing things for a while that are healthier. Um, it's very different when I go up to Northern California, the lifestyle and everything. And they opt for these unplugged retreats. And some companies are even incentivizing. I met a guy at Christmas time who said, I get two bonuses a year if I take two unplugged trips. They have their kids at Waldorf schools or low-tech schools um, where they're learning creativity and all of the good things, the social interactions. They even some of them have nannies that used to be called cell phone police nannies um, to make sure their kids are not on gadgets when they come home from school. I hear a lot from tech leaders that it's just there are many good tools and people just need to use them. We're managing. Why can't you all? They've had strict curfews and stuff with their kids, the big tech leaders we, we've learned about. Snapchat CEO Evan Spiegel will talk about how he was raised without any TV um, and how that made him have really good imagination and creativity and, and it was great and he wants his kids to have that same experience. I just wish they wanted it for our kids a little bit more because we can't all afford to do that. But they're raising red flags and we should pay attention to it, what they're doing. So you can evaluate the problem and adjust your choices. This is an example of what a teacher had done in the classroom. She let everybody have their phone and everybody let all the notifications were on at the time. And they tallied how many times it went off just to show how many distractions happen within a room. Um, this would be a great thing for a teacher to do anytime they want to do a little digital wellness lesson. Or you could do it at home even. We've got um, the Gen Zers are really getting it. Like, they are all about unplugging. Some of them are moving that way. They have been marketed to so heavily, and they're like, I'm done. Um, they're grabbing flip phones and, and opting for that. I don't think that if you have a kid on a smartphone that you should force them and take it away, but they might be interested. My daughter did this when she was a senior. She showed up with a flip phone. Everybody was like, what is that? Why I can't reach you. I don't even know. Where are you at? And it was like she became a woman of mystery. And she was more in demand. It was wild, so I think it can work. There are also a lot of minimalist phones, and there are in the resource packet back there are all these options for you to look at. But a lot of techies love these minimalist phones, the light too and all that. If you have a kid, you can get a watch that if you do want to track them, this would let you do that and also just give them a way to reach you and you to reach them. It's very limited. You don't have to go with a smartphone just because they're of the age that they're thinking that if you haven't started, go with a flip phone or watch. So I'm going through these super quick. It's all in the packet and more. But tech tips, obviously, be a good role model. That's so hard to do, but so important to do. Um, they're looking to us to see how we manage our own tech, make in-person connections a priority. And if you have not got a kid started on it, delay, delay, delay. That's like it, number one. It'll be so much easier for you. And if you think about when you're bringing in tech gifts, don't bring in as many as you think. Just because it's Christmas doesn't mean it means a new tech gadget this year. And in fact, I like to give them not at that time of year. And people are like, I wait until they're 16 and then they get to have the phone. You've added a lot of value to that phone. You know, give it to them on a boring Tuesday. Don't use this as the only way to calm your child because if when they're crying and upset, the first thing you do is hand their phone to them, they're learning, I need that to calm down. And they're not learning how to self-soothe, which is so important and probably even bigger for the big picture is that later on down the road when they're upset and they're really depressed, they're gonna turn to that. And that may be the last place you want them to be. 
um, incorporate your values, especially if you have to talk about things like AI girlfriends. <laughs> You're gonna need to do that. It doesn't have to come from a religious place, but it might need to come from, we value women, you know, let's, we value in-person connections. I recommend that you own the phone and not the kids, and I know people have different opinions about that. It's just mine that I think that that way then if they're not following your rules, you can take them back. If they've paid for it, parents have a hard time taking it back. Um, don't always use it as a reward or carrot, and this is something that most of us have been taught to do, actually. So I know my advice is contrary to most people's. If you say, I want you to clean your room, play with your little sister, and do the dishes, and then you can have your screen time. You have now lumped playing with your little sister in with all the drudgery duties, and they don't want to do it anymore. And also, you've now added more value to the phone or the game or whatever. So try to at least rotate it. Don't always make that thing be the great big end all be all. Use the parental tools. Again, suggestions in the, in the paper. And if you have a kid who's already on it, heavy media user, I don't, I don't believe in the cold turkey thing. I don't think it works. They'll just circumvent you and go figure stuff out. Um, you've got to go with the education and have them start learning about how these things are designed and it's taking their time. You can incorporate Tech Talk Tuesdays into your Tuesday night. It's a newsletter you can subscribe to for free from um, Dr. Rustan. She's the woman who made Screenagers movies. And it's just a good way every week to be able to have, it doesn't even have to be every week, but every once in a while you have a new topic you can talk about around the dinner table. This is important. Create a network of friends that will support you, even if it's one friend. You know, have one or two friends at, of the parents, and then with the kids, we're going to agree that when our kids are together, it's going to be screen-free time. We're going to do something fun at my house, they'll do something fun at your house, but we're not going to have screens. And the biggest thing is replace the time. Don't just go, we're taking phones away, figure it out. They, you have to fill the void. So we're talking about the negative stuff here, but really, I'm I'm personally all about... Talk about what you're doing instead. Focus on what you're going to do instead, which gets to this part. So everybody's coming from a different perspective, and somebody may say, I want to go home and try all these things. And then another person may be, I'm going to do one thing. It is all fine, and everybody has their own viewpoints about it. But try and do something. We can all do something. And I think that for me, if you start with yourself first and do one thing and then maybe do something with your family and if you can do something for your community exponentially it has a big impact so for me that's what i needed to do i of course harped on my family and my poor husband endlessly about screen time you can imagine how fun it was to grow up with me as a mom sometimes so i finally realized that um, i needed to stop doing that so much my husband, I wanted him to go on walks with me, go listen to the birds chirp, and go on unplugged retreats, and he's like, I don't want to do that. So I finally realized, I'm waiting to get in shape for you. That's stupid. I got to just do it. And so my, one of my biggest messages to people is that even if you live in a house where you're the only one who wants to do anything, and your whole family is like, I'm not doing any of that, do it anyway. Do it for yourself. Because what you'll find is that you will feel better, and you will be recharged, and you will be happier, and they will notice, and they may come around, and that's what happened in my family. So I joined Pilates because I'm like, wait a minute, why am I waiting for him to go walking? I love it. I spend time in the garden because that's, I got to connect with nature every day a little bit. I always wear a watch, and it's analog, and you know why it's analog? Because it will only tell me the time. <laughs> If it's a smart watch, I'm going to check for things. Or if I check my phone, I'm going to see the little notifications pop up. Having an alarm clock next to the bed that's not your phone means it greater likelihood it's not going to be the last thing you look at and the first thing in the morning. People always go, oh, I'd love to not have the phone there, but I use it as my alarm. And I'm like, Walmart, 10 bucks. Like, you can still, you can get, a, you can get one. I end my day with a bath so that I can really relax and kind of focus. So... Happiness is contagious. We know that anger and outrageification is more contagious. So we're fighting that, you know, as a society. But happiness is also contagious. So I also learned I have to find my fun magnet. And this is something Catherine Price um, writes about in her book, The Power of Fun. And I realized I'm not that 
I'm not that fun sometimes. Like, I'm all about being serious. Like, I've tried hard to be that person. I looked really young for a long time, so I want everybody to take me serious. But I am kind of a silly person, and I do like to have fun. So my fun magnet was my friend Carrie, who also has an uber-serious job. And during the pandemic, we realized we got to do something. So um, I don't know anyone else who would dress up in a dirndl dress, even though she's not even German, and go to a dive bar, a seedy dive bar, and play darts with me but she would do it. We get into mischief. I can't explain this picture, but we're, you wouldn't think we'd be silly, but we get into mischief. So find your fun magnet. So now back to my, as I'd call him, plugged in partner. This is my husband. This picture does not do justice as to what's going on here. He has four screens in front of him, including in addition to his phone and a big TV screen behind him. That's what he's used to, that's what he likes. He has his own law firm. He feels he needs to be on all the time. I've worked long and hard on this project. But I finally realized this is kind of like stop trying to make fetch happen, you know, stop trying to make unplugging happen. So I finally realized I need to quit going about it that way and just look for things to happen to be unplugged that we enjoy. So this is a comedy night we had in our backyard. And we had a great time. Comedy nights are awesome because they don't like you to have your phone. I don't have to preach about it. Then I started realizing, you know, he has some times that he likes to get together with people and he has some fun already with his poker nights. I'm gonna support this. This is a great social thing for him. So then I started realizing, you know, he's up for a little bit of fun, so he doesn't wanna go walking, but he wouldn't mind scootering. So we got scooters, so we're like two 15 year olds scootering around town. It's a blast. Makes us again feel kind of playful. I am notorious for planning unplugged trips where the Wi-Fi is very bad. You know, at first you get kind of mad at me, and then, but then he enjoys it, especially if it's spectacular like this one in Switzerland. You know, what are you going to complain about? So now he just is used to it. And then here we are later in that trip in Italy where I was able to come around and compromise and go, it's good that he had his technology because he had a translator, and we were with three other Italian families who spoke zero English. So we could communicate with them. And so I was able to go, I don't have to always be, you know, no phone. And now, this is a barbecue competition called Let Go of Our Butts. We know what we're doing. That was our team name that we came up with. And he has the biggest grin I'll ever see right there. And it's, you know, that's our shirt. Now, at some points, he's the happy and relaxed partner. It's taken a bit to get there, but he can be. So... Honestly, I've learned that it's a whole lot less about, are we doing something without our phones? Are we, you know, whatever, plugged in? And are we connecting? So I focus more on that and where are our good times. And then with my niece, who I talked about, she's had many, many an uphill, rocky road battle with mental health and issues from social media that really exacerbated everything. She's a trooper. She's doing so much better. We do handcraft things together. My son, we like to go to music things together. He games so much less now. He still does game, but not nearly as much. He's got the balance. My daughter loves anything with nature, as always. So ideas for kids and families give them some independence and adventure. And I understand you don't have good walking areas here in town. I'm aware of that. That's kind of my neighborhood, too. There's no, like, sidewalks. It's, a bum it's beautiful, but it's a bummer. But maybe you can work some things out anyway that work in your area. And if they're little, do something in their home that lets them be independent. Kids all want to help out. They want to clean. They want to do things. Give them something that makes them feel adult. When they're older, I say get them on a bus or get them on public transportation. My kids were on the trolley when they were 16. All my friends were like, that's so dangerous. They learn how to deal with people that don't all look like us and that some of them might even be dangerous, so they'll sit up front. It's okay. Skateboarding, I had my son skateboarding to his job because they both worked when they were 16 and they got their own cars, which were crappy little cars, but they felt so proud of it. And if you're worried about them, get them into some karate or self-defense, so then you'll feel a little better. But really, honestly, if you just try letting them be a little more um, independent after they've succeeded a couple times, you'll feel like, Okay, they can handle themselves. Because I know I, made through I went through that transition to, am I worried about all the people or am I worried about them not knowing how to handle things? So I can't recommend gardening enough. This is my son. Um, 
I was the worst eater in the world, a lot of health problems because of it when I was a kid. So I made sure with my kids, I swear by this, if you have them help you grow it, tend to it, they get to pick it and they get to cook it, they're gonna eat it. And they're all really healthy eaters to this day. And during the pandemic, Instagram figured out everybody loves green plants. So all the young people love the plants, right? So plants and fish. So, uh, you know, you can encourage those kinds of things. Maybe you have something you need in the house, um, a bookshelf or whatever. You don't have to buy one that's already made. Maybe you can get IKEA if there's one of those around here or something where they can build and they can learn how to use their hands. I find a lot of the teen boys in the neighborhood really want these experiences and they don't have them at home. So um, I always pay them to come over and build something for me. These are all good games to pick that you don't have to say it's phone free because they already are. Trivia nights, it's cheating if you have your phone. Escape rooms, they make you lock it up. And if you can't go to an escape room because there isn't one, um, we have a link to a woman who created her own online. This would be a cool thing for older kids to do for younger kids too. Retro games are all the rage right now. I like anything that's going to use their hands and keep them busy and give them many hours to get good at. So yo-yoing is not easy if you've never done it. So that's kind of a fun one. Rubik's Cube, origami, hacky sack, all these things where they can kind of do stuff that keeps their hands busy because that's the key. You're replacing the phone. Ice blocking. I know you guys can have snow and everything here. We don't in San Diego. So we do this in the summertime. Get a big old thing of ice and you put an old towel on it and you slide down the hill. And I tell you, every time we would do this, the college kids would walk by and go, what is that? And they would run to the store and get one and join us. So everybody seems to like it. It's a very inexpensive thing to do. This is the shawl that my niece made who used to be on social media nonstop. And so it means everything to me that she made this and I know it took her a lot of hours to do it that she would have spent online otherwise. So that's what she will do on a Friday night instead of being out. It's not what I did at her age with that. So I love that they're kind of doing some of these things. They're finding things that keep their hands busy. You can make a flower garland. A lot of kids are into embroidery with the jeans. That takes a lot of time and focus and patience. And absolutely, again, like the gardening, introduce them to cooking. This is so important no matter what age they are. These two little kiddos were four and six here when we did this pizza demo, and I just brought over the shells, but they had their own knives, kid-friendly knives. They cut up vegetables, and they ate all kinds of things they never would have eaten before. They're so proud to give this to their parents. If they're a little older, you can do like my daughter. This is her Instagram post, so their feeds all look different now. Now she has boy picnic when she went on a picnic with her boyfriend cooking a steak. So it may be that they want a barbecue or grill if they're older. Get them in charge of dinner once a week. Have them help you out. So things the way a community can kind of come together. First thing I say is be really welcoming because I do hear from young men that they don't feel welcome. They feel like they're met with suspicion. That's why I love Vanessa's block party idea because you can get them out um, and meeting other people in the neighborhood and so then maybe you know, the woman down there who thinks they're up to no good meets them and knows. They're just normal kids, right? So I think there's a lot you can do. And if you do a block party, you can have, like, different competitions. We had a barbecue competition and a bake-off competition, and we made teen categories. So we told the parents, bring your kids. There are prizes for these categories so that they would come. They have to have a reason to come. Otherwise, they're going to feel nervous and awkward. This is Unplugged Village, Lomita, California. This is a coffee shop. Um, and they just put a post up here on the left that said, what would a day of unplugging look like to you? And people wrote these beautiful sentiments. And they hung them up in all the windows and kept them up for months because it was so neat. It was a very simple thing to do. Um, they also did a stuffed animal sleepover because they had a lot of families with kids. And this where they tucked in the animals. Kids could come bring their little friendly stuffed whatever animal. and get them tucked in at night on a Friday night, and then they had to go home, and then the adults took pictures of them getting into shenanigans, climbing on walls and reading books and, you know, getting in the kitchen, and then they would put them on a poster board, and the next morning the kids come back for a pajama story time and be reunited with their animal. It was so fun, adorable. 
this is another coffee shop that um, has Wi-Fi downtimes on the weekend, and it says, for friends and family to connect. They also have laptop-free tables designated for this. This works because it's a very trendy coffee shop. They're very busy, um, and they have a lot of young adults that come, and what we're finding is that coffee shops are becoming the neighborhood community gathering place for that age group because they don't necessarily feel welcome or maybe they're not even from that neighborhood originally. So they're finding things and we're finding coffee shops wanting to do things for global day of unplugging. This is Staten Island where they had a, um, an unplug activity at the Home Depot. They always have those workshops. They did a community garden. They put little free libraries, which are the book sharing boxes, up all over town and kids could come, grab books. Here's one that happened in Texas um, about a month ago where they did a scavenger hunt on 10 different little free libraries around town and you could read the clue and then they could get books and little prizes. Um, we have the clues, it's all free on our website to do this. We have fairy theme, gnome theme, nocturnal creatures, dragons, you name it. This was what we did for um, young adults. We have Unplugged Artist Ambassadors, and our very first one was Hardcastle. And they asked guests to swap their phones in the middle of the set for one song, and they would, um, we handed out these light sticks. And I did not know how impactful this would be. I'm like, you're gonna do what? One thing? Like, is that gonna even mean anything? And they loved it, and he said, this is to get you out of your heads and into the moment and the collective effervescence we are having. It's a big grand thing. And they screamed, and they loved it, and they, were waving the light sticks around and nobody took their phone back out. And then there were all these good comments afterwards about how wonderful this was. So sometimes it's the subtle little things that you do, not talking about it, not preaching about it. I'm learning the less I talk about unplugging and the more we just make fun unplugged things, the more people like it. This was another neat thing that has happened. Um, Club Rewire, this young woman, she's a Gen Zer. She um, and her partner pair up with a therapist, a licensed therapist, and they'll talk about one topic or another. Um, this was about the psychology of breakups, and they'll do a little handcraft, a little journaling, and they're meeting over drinks or whatever, and it's more informal, and it's connecting, and they're enjoying that, so it's not intimidating like some other kind of educational things might be. You might want a community cleanup. This was in Georgia where they did that so they could have a farmer's market, and they got all the kids involved. This is one of my very favorite things to do in San Diego, beach art. Rakes, beach, that's it. You know, manpower, and you can make mandalas, you can even get a drone, so you have the tech at the end to get the picture afterwards. Um, and people love doing this, and it's unusual. Young adults like doing this. You don't have a beach too far from here is my understanding. You could do a little road trip. Encourage kids shopping. I think this is so important, and I know that statistic about 50% of Americans won't let their kids age 9 to 11 into another grocery aisle. So whether you do or don't do that, I hope you do eventually, but I think even when they're little and they're sitting in the cart with you, they can have their own small little grocery list that has pictures even before they're reading. You're looking for three oranges, two red apples, and a green cucumber. You're then helping them learn numbers, colors, they're getting acquainted with vegetables and fruits, and most importantly, they're helping, and they all wanna help. The kids grow up wanting to be helpers, so tap into it, and you don't have to hand them your phone. And I think the grocery store could do, you know, little, little rewards or a little scavenger hunt and get little baskets. This is my favorite thing. Some of you already know that. I love the farmer's market. Um, we did a scavenger hunt. We hid Rodney Rooster which is this little guy right there. It's just a stuffed rooster. Would hide at a different vendor booth each week. And I had a sign down low and then a clue that would change out, like the blue one here. And so they knew it was microgreens for this one. And then they'd go look for him and if they found him, they'd come back and tell us and they'd get a little prize. And sometimes we did other little fun activities. But this was a hit immediately. And I had to continue because the little ones told me that I had to. So I did it for a while till the pandemic shut everything down. Um, and this was also from that same market. I called the kids that followed him his peeps. So each time they could put a little peep on the barn so I could have a visual of how many kids visited that day. 
but this mom, this was the shyest girl here on the right. It's a fluke that we caught her looking at the camera at all because she would not look up for months. She wouldn't say anything, but she wanted to find Rodney Rooster. That was like it for her. And her mom was a professor and really was trying to help her get out of her shell. So she knew this was a good thing. And she would come and she got to the point where she could ask, she could talk and engage. And I even got a high five and a hug the last day from her. And it meant everything to me as a previous really shy kid. I'm like, you can come out of that shell. It happens. And it's the best thing is this opportunity for weekly family connection. So instead of the big global day of unplugging, which we love, because one time a year we can do things that are more frequent. This is the lantern decorating activity. We call this light up La Mesa, but we've done it other places too. It's just those paper lanterns that you get, and you can give stickers that the littlest ones can put on so they feel like they're doing something, even if they can't paint or color. Other people did markers. And you hang... Um, what do we call those? Not streamers, but ribbon. Ribbons off the bottom. And then they get hung up at the end of the night on bulb lights like you have out here at the library. And it's just this really collective feeling that we're all coming together. You can have them write inspirational words. Um, that one said, believe there is good in the world. And everybody loved doing this. You can even then give, let them take them home, or you can give them to people in nursing homes who can't leave. They really love that. So I'm very inspired about the future. I worry a lot about things like AI, but honestly, there are so many people getting involved with this now that I feel hopeful for the first time in a long time. You got all the youth seriously into it. Um, advocates, tech is getting into it. This is Hinge that created a wild posting in some big cities like New York City, um, encouraging people to unplug. And we've had proclamations with several cities from mayors, you know, saying this is important to do. We've had the First Lady of Maryland who, you know, made a big deal about it and had her youth groups go out and do a hike and her staff. When that happens, that trickles down to everybody in the community, right? So that's great. We've had um, students in college that create activities for kids. This was a break the screen routine this public health group did for a middle school. They did activities for every single day for these kids. They made it really fun. And this on the left is Emma Lemke. She's our youth advisor, and she's just, we love her to pieces, and she goes to Washington all the time while she's trying to finish her degree. But she'll go and um, talk about how to get tech to be more healthy um, and pass COSA and different legislation. So she's working hard. She got money from Meghan Markle and Prince Harry to do her work. When we know things like that are happening, stuff's moving. You know, we're getting people that are supporting these efforts. And this kid over here is just a cool dude, Sean Killingsworth. He's in Florida. He was really bummed when he went to high school and everybody's faces were in their phones. And he was like, this was supposed to be fun. And it wasn't, and he was disappointed. So he started the Reconnect movement, and that's on several college campuses now. We have a lot of famous people that are unplugged, or they maybe have somebody manages their account, but they don't do it anymore, or they have make sure their kids are not on social media. And we had some that joined us for Global Day of Unplugging, and they encouraged people to crochet these letters that would spell out welcome home, and they were gifted to people transitioning out of homelessness into their first home. So we had some celebs come on and do that for us. And I hope you'll all join us next March 7th, 8th for Global Day of Unplugging. But that's it. I hope that we'll see lots of cool, amazing things happen here in Wilton. I'm so excited by all the resources and activity you have going on already. So, and there's a survey coming, correct? So please do the survey. I know everybody's got information overload, but please do the survey if you can, because it's helpful to get feedback. Appreciate it. Thank you.